Coming up on Week in Review, finally cleared for takeoff. But is this really the end of the drama over KCI? Plus, how is it conceivable that a man's body can sit unnoticed for eight months in a KCI parking lot? Is the Kansas City social scene for whites only a provocative front page story? Chronicles an exodus of black millennials who feel our hometown tolerates but doesn't welcome them. Plus what mayhem in St. Louis means for Kansas City and do protests make a difference? Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more straight ahead as we connect the dots on the news of the week in this place we call home. Fresh from another round of action at City Hall over KCI is the Kansas City star Steve Vokrot making sense of the news of the day from behind the microphone at 98.1 KMBZ. Scott Parks, Aaron Randall is the star reporter who wrote the provocative piece on the Kansas City social scene this week. Glad to have him with us, along with columnist and star editorial writer Dave Helling. Now, I am very aware that many viewers may now be fed up and totally fatigued about hearing yet again about the latest twists and turns in the debate over the future of KCI. But this week, can we say it's finally been settled? The full Kansas City Council voting this week to greenlight Maryland-based Edgemoor infrastructure to finance, design and build a new single terminal pending approval by voters on November 7th. But Steve, yes or no, is this really the final decision. <laughs> Can well, we close the book on this? No, not at all. Okay. I, so they, as you mentioned, they have to negotiate a contract, a memorandum, or a more uh, specifically a memorandum of understanding. So there will be some negotiations with Edgemore, which is a company based out of Maryland, uh, about specific terms uh, and, and so forth. We're not certain when that's going to happen. Um, and, and then there's the vote on November 7th, which is the final say about whether this thing uh, happens or doesn't. And uh, it's the editorial board, uh, Dave Helling, writing this week about the fact that when they peeled back the onion on the decision-making process, actually there was no formal vote of the selection committee, there was no matrix to look at numbering the specific bids. Um, is there still options here for a lawsuit from one of these other companies? Well, I, uh, there are uh, suggestions yesterday that Burns and McDonald would will not pursue litigation against the city of Kansas City. That's what I was told. We'll see. It's a bit problematic for Burns and Mack to pursue that because it does other business with the city, and if it were to sue, it would make things very, very difficult. AECOM may yet be uh, come forward. They have some history of litigiousness, so they may uh, try to take it to court. But uh, uh, while Steve's right, this we can't close the book, we have turned at a, a very important corner. Uh, from May, when Burns and Mac first suggested this no-bid sole source contract to now, the city has taken a rather arduous journey. <laughs> uh, it's been quite an ordeal, but we do have a proposed developer. If voters say yes on November 7th and other contractual matters can be straightened out, Edgemore will build a new Contractual contract. matters, one of them last week we were hearing a lot about was the minority contracts. How many minority contractors would be on this? How many minority workers would be on the, on the actual job, uh, Aaron? I think that's a, a very important question. I know that uh, uh, Burns and McDonald had that uh, agreement with minority business um, businesses to kind of partner with them and employ them. Are they going to release uh, them from that contract? Well, Aaron, that's a great question, and at, <laughs> at least to date they haven't, but I will tell you that minority contractors who had a relationship with Burns and Mac were at City Hall yesterday, and they were handing out business cards. You can guess that that problem will be solved before any final memorandum of understanding is signed. And with all of these twists and turns and all of this politics over really it's been a five month period of time now, um, does this diminish the prospects in the public's mind of this passing because people have been frustrated by how all of this has gone <clears throat> down, Scott? Nick, I've always argued I'm, I'm usually invited here to be the voice of Joe Sixpack. And if I can speak for Joe Sixpack, Joe Sixpack is convinced that this is being shoved down his throat, that the, the November vote is a foregone conclusion, that it's already going to happen. The, the city is operating, the mayor, for that matter, is operating almost as if it's already done. There is a vote. The people do have the right to speak. But I think most people <clears throat> who are not in the mover and shaker club uh, feel like this is being shoved down their throat. I've made the argument in the past it's purely anecdotal. 
I believe, and the city would deny it, that they are letting the current KCI fall to pieces to, to force you to vote yes come November 7th. Now, you represent the Diet Coke and Gatorade right. crowd. Is that right, Steve? Is that your constituency? I'm Dave uh, 12 Pack, okay, by right. the way. <laughs> I'll do an old fashioned, but, uh, it, you know, if, if you talk to the insiders, you know, the, the almost unanimous perspective is. You know, as a result of these latest discussions, the upside to it is that everybody's moved off the dime about whether Kansas City needs a new airport, and the discussion really is at this point uh, how and who's involved. And that may be true among the insiders, but uh, it, there's a whole world out there uh, that uh, that's going to vote. And if you know, one of the things that I'll be talking about in a weekend story on Sunday is, you know, if you look at the citizen satisfaction surveys that the city does every year. Uh, the, if the, the satisfaction with KCI is still around 70%. That's a pretty high number. And then when you kind of compare that to this idea that about 20% of Kansas City, Missouri residents are using the airport, uh, those make for some headwinds for, for the airport uh, vote. It's going to be a matter of turnout also um, and how, mo it's how motivated people are going to be on either side to, to get out. And there has been talk that the November ballot 7th. language is such, though, Dave Helling, that even if voters said no to the airport, the city council could now move forward anyway and, well, and go ahead with this. There, there's a theory that that could happen, Nick, but as a practical matter, if the voters say no to the airport, it will be buried for years. I, it, it, just politically bringing you back would be tough, but Steve said something very important to keep in mind. Remember, this is just the people of Kansas City, Missouri voting. It isn't Johnson County. It isn't Wyandotte County. Other airport users have no say in this debate. It's really Kansas City, Missouri. And the voters in Kansas City, Missouri, who don't use the airport, will need to be convinced that this is something to support. There are two things in that argument that will be helpful. First, no tax money is involved. And second, it will create some jobs, particularly, at least prospectively, uh, for minority communities, minority contractors and others. You'll see a lot about that in the campaign to come. Now, for all the political talk over the single terminal construction project, the biggest story at the airport was a different one. Making international news was the discovery of a body of a man found decomposing in a KCI parking lot for eight months. 53-year-old Randy Potter from the Nexa vanished without a trace back in January. KCI Airport Police found his body this week inside his Dodge Ram truck in Economy Lot B. He had taken his own life. According to the police report, a passenger returning from a three-day trip called law enforcement after noticing a strong odor coming from the truck parked next to his vehicle, as well as a large number of flies. But he had been there for eight months. How does that ha happen, Scott Parks? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> in, in, in one sentence, I don't know. Um, I can understand because he apparently committed suicide in, in the winter where perhaps the body would have been maintained uh, during the cold weather months, but come spring, come the summer, with the odor coming out of that car, that, and <clears throat> I'm, no, I'm no CSI agent, but uh, I can only imagine it was a putrid smell. Uh, how that went unnoticed, uh, I... I Nick, I don't know. I has no has there been a satisfactory answer from airport officials or the city about this, Steve? No, there hasn't. Uh, there's supposed to be checks on uh, on the air uh, on the cars that are in the parking garage, and you know I think there's some question about whether that was actually happening. Uh, one one could suppose that it wasn't, uh, or at least not rigorously. Um, you know, if you think about the landscape when you park in these economy lots, it's a uh, it's an ocean of cars, it's an ocean of pavement. Um, you know, it's people moving back and forth just really for one purpose. It's to make the bus to get to the airport or to get back to their car um, uh, to, to, to get back home. And, you know, uh, th this person's body was not the first body to be found at the uh, KCI parking lot. It's worth noting. But, but it does give the impression that what else could be hiding at the airport um, if it takes eight months for them to find a vehicle, Aaron? Yeah, once I got over the actual shock, like um, Scott said, like how does that happen? You, the next question has to be, what are the implications of that? Like we, we have heightened the security so much inside the airport, but now you have to wonder like, what is the security like outside? Obviously it must not be as good as they're saying that it is if a body can lay somewhere for eight months. And does this diminish then people's feelings about how things are running at the airport at a time when we're asking people to spend a billion dollars for a new terminal? Well, the opposite may be the case, 
supporters of a new terminal might say, well, we're going to build new parking and this won't be quite the problem that it was in this case. Remember, the parking lot is operated by a subcontractor, a private contractor. That contractor will have some questions to, to answer. But Steve says something interesting. You know, the, the, I think there are 6,000 spots in this particular lot. I think Arrowhead and the, the Truman Sports Complex has about 20,000 spots. So just imagine this lot, a third of the size of the parking, all the parking out at the Truman Sports Complex, that's a big lot. And so it's, it's at least understandable, if not defensible, that this kind of incident would happen. This week, the Kansas City Star runs a provocative front page story with the question, is the Kansas City social scene for whites only? Black millennials, they say, are tolerated, not welcomed. The extensive report chronicles how young, talented, and ambitious African Americans are ditching KC and heading to more accepting cities. If you missed the story, some departing millennials claim KC didn't have any places where they could meet other young black professionals. It was difficult finding spaces that felt diverse and truly welcoming to people who look like me. My impression of KC is there's a lot of white people who want to stay away from a lot of black people. And a DJ playing a gig in Westport tells the story of a nightclub owner who whispers concern when too many black patrons walk through the doors. Quote, it's getting a little dark in here. Aaron Randall, you wrote the piece. What has been the response behind the scenes since that story ran Sunday on the front page? Uh, the sponsors have run the gamut. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, we have a lot of um, black people that have responded, African Americans, people of color. They have um, said that, you know, they've been waiting for this story to be told. Um, I was surprised. I've heard the responses have, have been a wide range. I've, I've had a lady, she was 70 years old, who told me how 30 years ago she remember having this conversation with her son who was frustrated with the social scene. Then there are people my age, of course, who, uh, who felt the same way. And then I was also, um, it ranged as well from, from people that weren't black. You know, white people who told me that they did not know that this was an issue and thanks for opening their eyes. And of course there were those who, who just believed that this was not an issue. And uh, those who believe that it's kind of trivial or, you know, kind of frivolous of a thing to even really discuss. This became a big conversation topic on your radio station this week. How was this sized up, Scott? 50-50, uh, I think. And, and not to put Aaron on the spot, and I'm not going <clears> to <throat> grill him on his first appearance on your show. <laughs> um, you know, I think it would all come down to, and this was the argument I made on the radio, what is the definition of welcomed? Uh, are black people coming into restaurants and, and clubs and they're getting looks or they're being told, get out, we don't want you here, we don't want your kind here, to quote from Star Wars. Um, if that's the case, that's a problem. And that's one that needs to be addressed and remedied quickly. Are you not hearing the kind of music that you want to hear? Are you not finding people of the same color in this restaurant or bar? And if, if that's the case, I don't know that that's a problem necessarily. I happen to like heavy metal music. I cannot walk into an Applebee's or Lucky's in Mission or any restaurant on the plaza or any restaurant in Power and Light and hear the kind of music that I like. That doesn't mean I feel unwelcome. And I think it okay. all goes down to what is the definition of welcome. So what makes, what makes the difference in his analogy there? <clears throat> and uh, I think that it's more than just, you know, the music, right? Uh, a lot of times when people of color go into these spaces, uh, the patrons, the, uh, the bartenders, the waiters, like, we, we, you feel just attention. You know, sometimes you, you are, if you aren't ignored completely, you, there seems to be kind of just in a, uh, there's a, there's a palpable kind of aggression that, just makes you feel like, do they really want me here? Like, they don't really want to be bothered with you, so to speak. Now, I poured through a lot of the comments, and there was a ton of them that came on the Kansas City Star website. Just a couple I pulled here. This is from Linda. How many young blacks are recruited to serve on nonprofit boards, such as the Art Museum, uh, serve as debutantes, attend church in Johnson County, KC? has been and always will be segregated. Gary and Raymo asks, as a white man, if I made the statement, I want to go where people look like me, then I'd be labeled as a racist. Why do black professionals get a pass on this way of thinking? Well, to be frank, you would rarely say that as a white man because almost everywhere that you go does look like you. As a minority, uh, that's the difference between a white experience and a black experience. And I think that a lot of times, a lot of these um, comments, it's, a common problem that I think happens in these conversations, uh, people who insert their own experiences and assume that because they don't experience it, it doesn't happen. And that is why I want this 
article to be written just to open the conversation and to show that though you may not experience it, it is happening and it does, it's important to some people. And they really feel that they want to see the topic addressed and hopefully rectified. Now, it did get you talking about it, Scott, so that obviously well, did open up people's... wanted to start a conversation. No, it did, start oh, oh, it did open one. Yeah, uh, one of the things you mentioned I heard on your radio station was the concern that this was not a statistical portrait. These were some anecdotal examples of people who decided, I wasn't feeling comfortable in Kansas City, I'm moving to Dallas or Atlanta, but this wasn't based on a scientific look at what was happening in Kansas City. I, I was the one that made the argument that uh, I thought the piece, and I said it to Aaron before we started the program today, I thought it was incredibly well written. Um, but if I can criticize the piece as somebody with a journalism degree, uh, I, th I thought it lacked in research. Um, there, there, it seemed to be a very anecdotal piece. Um, we, can we find six, seven, eight, nine people that don't feel comfortable when they walk into a nightclub or into a restaurant in Kansas City? Yes, we can. Um, you can find six, seven, eight, nine people who can say anything about Kansas City. Um, <clears throat> It, it, is there a problem? I don't know, and, and I'm not going to pretend that I do know. What I would only say to Aaron is that you know, if this is a problem, then let's have this conversation. And, and I think he did that. He opened up the door for a conversation. Is it a problem? My jury's still out. Dave. I would just add that Kansas City uh, has, shares a problem that extends beyond the specific thing in Aaron's piece. In terms of its size, that will be important for the people who lead the community to understand. In places like Atlanta or Dallas or Los Angeles or Manhattan, uh, there are, the, the community is large enough that almost every potential experience is available. I mean, there's, there's going to be a club or a place to go for almost everybody. Smaller communities like Kansas City don't really have that. And I think one of the things Aaron's story identified is that sense that there aren't a wide range of options, not just for the African-American community, but for all kinds of younger people who may want a more urban experience. I don't mean that in a racial sense, but just the idea of being more like Brooklyn, you know, and Kansas City isn't. When we begin to recruit companies like Amazon or try to get younger people here for tech jobs and other things, the lack of that bigness is a problem. That's why we don't have mass transit. That's why the airport is in a little bit of a, uh, a pinch and I think what Aaron's story reflects is this idea that we have to make some decisions about ways to be more attractive to that, to that kind of audience. Absolutely, I think that at the root of this story is there's a, there's a civic pride at play, right? And there's a, just wanting to see your city do better. This is not just complaining for the sake of complaining. This is us realizing, millennials knowing that Kansas City, we, we have this chip on our shoulder, right? We want to be seen as this new great city, especially for millennials. Well, the millenn what is a hallmark of millennial if it's not diversity in our, proclivity for inclusivity and we just aren't many of us believe we aren't working towards that with a great enough effort right in the center of the country kansas and missouri has had its fair share of devastating tornadoes that have destroyed entire towns from joplin missouri to greensburg kansas and we've seen extreme flooding right here in the last few weeks all situations requiring federal aid to help with rebuilding efforts so why did almost all of the kansas and missouri delegation in congress vote to oppose giving aid to those devastated by this latest string of hurricanes elsewhere in the country. In Kansas, Senator Jerry Moran and local Congressman Kevin Yoda both voted no. So did our local members of Congress from Missouri, Sam Graves and Vicki Hartzler. Now the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee running attack ads on Kevin Yoda over his vote. The Star editorial board wrote, it's hard to overstate the anger and shame Kansans should feel about Yoder's vote. Playing politics instead of helping neighbors in need. The next time a natural disaster strikes Kansas, where will Yoder stand? Okay, wh why the reluctance, first of all? What was the decision? Why did they vote no? Do we have a better understanding well, of yeah, that? Well, yeah, the argument is that the aid for the victims of Hurricane Harvey was linked to an extension of the debt ceiling through December. Uh, and Republicans said, no, we want to use the debt ceiling as leverage to cut spending in other areas. We're not against the disaster money. We're against the uh, added uh, 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 increase in the, in the nation's debt. In almost every way, that's kind of a silly argument. The debt ceiling was going to go up one way or another. It's a political judgment, not a practical judgment based on merits. 
the 15 million dollar 15 billion dollars I'm sorry is de minimis in the in the uh, not only in terms of the entire budget but what they're going to have to spend on Irma and Harvey and whatever damage is caused in Puerto Rico uh, by uh, Hurricane Maria I mean th it's been a season of hurricanes and then the final thing is Nick it isn't just tornadoes although tornadoes are a problem or floods we've had ice storms blizzards Every time the government has come to the aid of Kansas and Missouri and to, in essence, turn your back on those people in Houston for political reasons seem to us a little offensive. Scott, that ad actually was in running on your radio station oh, quite know. extensively, <laughs> it seems, almost every break. But I'll say, in, in general, in, in the sense of the Kansas 3rd District, I mean, do in the, all of the basket of issues people deal with, how does that resonate with people? Is that really important? I, I think on a national level, it would hurt Kevin Yoder on a local level. I, I don't think it does. In fact, I think it, it would take, uh, I'm not going to make a bad pun here, but it, it would take a, uh, an incredible political storm uh, to knock Kevin Yoder out of his seat. That's not to say he is a congressman in perpetuity, but that is to say that I think uh, due to a se several factors, name recognition, longevity in office, uh, failure for the Democrats to bring in somebody who could actually, I think, beat him. Uh, I, 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 I think it, I, I really have yeah, trouble me, finding this to be a problem for right, Kevin Let me Yoder. just say quickly, I, I agree with that. I don't think it's a fatal issue. And uh, on the other hand, it's hard to see the politics of it. It's hard to see the people in Johnson County rising up in indignation if Kevin Yoder had actually supported aid for True. victims of Hurricane True. Harvey. Uh, and, or an indignation about the debt ceiling. I don't think people paid that much attention to it. So it's hard to understand the political calculus of, in essence, taking a vote that's going to stick out a little bit. And uh, he, he made that decision, and I think the Democrats are trying. But to there make were also of it. many Texas Republicans who also voted against aid to their own state. Right, and and th you know this is an on I've written about this issue for ten years, Nick, because. You do have to pay the goose if you pay the gander on it. Well, three years ago, Ferguson, Missouri was erupting in violence, and as a candidate for Missouri governor, Eric Greitens blasted sitting governor Jay Nixon for his response. If he'd been in charge, Greitens insisted, things would have been very different. The great tragedy of Ferguson was that if we'd had a leader who'd shown up with any kind of command presence and courage and calm and clarity, we could have had peace by the second. Well, now he's governor. Eric Greitens is being tested after a week of violence and demonstrations in St. Louis following the acquittal of a white police officer in the shooting death of a black suspect. Some news reports claiming Greitens hasn't achieved the peace he guaranteed on the campaign trail. But isn't it fair to say that despite some destruction of property and some ugly clashes between police and some protesters, the violence has come nowhere close to what was witnessed in Ferguson, Scott? Yes. I, I, I don't know if you can credit or blame a governor in this regard. Uh, but but I think in 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 regard to what has happened in St. Louis, I think it's been I hate to use this term acceptable uh, the, the the damage the the protesting the response from the governor. Uh, but no, it's been nothing like Ferguson. The other criticism of um, Jay Nixon at the time was it took him five days to get to Ferguson. Uh, we were getting press releases of images, and there were Facebook videos featuring Eric Greitens almost immediately in St. Louis. Steve Okra. Right, yeah, I mean, Nixon's response was uh, fair to say slow, and uh, particularly because there wasn't much pressing, much else pressing going on while he was, I think he was touring some schools elsewhere in the state while this whole issue with uh, Ferguson. So the context of both of those situations, uh, I mean, there's, there's a pretty decent sized ocean between them. Are there any lessons for us here in Kansas City based on what we're seeing in St. Louis, Aaron? I think um, one of the lessons that I take away from this is that these things are unpredictable, you know, and I think that uh, there's, there's a weariness that you said acceptable. I think there is definitely a weariness at play from, uh, from black people when people, when unarmed people are shot by the police or in this case, I guess, um, we believe he was unarmed, right? Uh, the, the, that was in dispute. Well, the judges yeah, that's in dispute. Um, I'm not sure that there is a lesson to be learned, really, other than that this can happen anywhere. And, and we all know that Kansas City is extremely segregated, and it's, I think it's a racial, it, it's a keg in, in a way. So uh, something to learn, no, just hope that it doesn't happen here, because I think that we could see a similar result. Dave. I would only add that the Ferguson violence was a reaction in some ways 
spontaneous reaction to a specific set of grievances, mm -hmm. particularly the use of municipal court as a way to raise money and the tickets and arrests and other things and the oppressive nature really of the police department, uh, department in that community. And it became very organic and then sort of fed on itself. In this case, after several summers of these kinds of incidents, the, the authorities were able to plan. The protesters, in a way, were able to plan. And so I think that's why you didn't see quite the organic violence in St. Louis that you might have seen in other places around the country. Last week, we discussed plans to bring 1,600 jobs to our metro as Tyson was promising to build a more than $300 million plant in Tonganoxie, producing trays of chicken for grocery stores. But after a public outcry and a decision by county leaders to back away from incentives, the state now says the company is putting its plans on hold and entertaining offers from at least 15 other Kansas cities who are interested in seeing the plant build in their communities. Some people ask, what is the value of protest? Was this decision an example of how protesters can change an outcome? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. I mean, the community really made its voices heard. Now, they'll tell you they don't think it's over, it may not be over, but, but you know, Tyson was pretty definitive <clears throat> after two weeks, we're going to look somewhere else. With the Royals' playoff chances fading close to zero, the Chiefs are getting all the attention in Kansas City, but we don't want to leave this week in review without acknowledging our other professional sports team, Sporting KC, earning this week one of the biggest prizes in U.S. soccer, the Open Cup, beating the New York Red Bulls two goals to one. Scott, it might not be the Super Bowl or the World Series, but this is still a big deal? It is a big deal. It is not a huge deal. It is uh, MLS and American soccer's continued attempts to create a UEFA Champions League, and they simply we are not on that level yet. All right, and that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers this week, Aaron Randall and Steve Vokrot, Scott Parks and Dave Helling. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.